and I guess good evening for many of you uh, in India and across the world. My name is uh, Yuri Punj. I am the president and co-founder of Student, and uh, we are delighted to be able to present another webinar for everybody. Um, we've got a special treat for you guys today uh, with Sandeep Roy. Um, many of you, um, when I, whenever I meet with students uh, in India and across the world, uh, always ask about, you know, what is, uh, uh, what are the Ivy Leagues like? What is, uh, uh, what is the environment like? How do I get there? And parents are all often very curious in terms of what is it like to send my uh, my child out to uh, this institution many, many, many miles away from home. And so we thought it would be a great idea to you know, give you a uh, sort of a journey of a real student, you know, who went through this process, you know, the anxieties, the preparation, the, uh, you know, the getting adjusted to college life. And, and, and I think Sandeep's a great example uh, of someone who's done it very, very successfully. So, you know, I think it's a good opportunity from you to learn from him um, and then ask as many questions as you want and uh, we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So Sandeep, welcome. Thanks a lot, and it's uh, it's all yours. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for that introduction. And so I'm Sandeep, and I just like to start with a few sort of prepared remarks that I had, just sort of describing, you know, some of the key points of my journey to university, how I approach the whole process, and also how I found my first year. So probably start by pulling up a presentation for you and going off that. Yeah, I hope everyone can see the this my screen at the moment. But yeah, so essentially that picture is just of me um, when I was moving in with my family to my dorm. And so just I just to reiterate, I just want to describe what the journey was like and how I approach it all. So the first part is, I suppose, the application mindset, the application, and sort of approaching applying to universities. And the way I generally went about it first was by mapping out what exactly I thought were my strengths and what I thought were my interests. So two years prior to actually applying to university, I started to actually think about, you know, what were the areas that I wanted to focus on in particular, what were the areas that I felt I showed most depth in and what were the areas that I felt that I wanted to go into most depth in. And so for me, just to give you an example, those areas I felt were fairly, some were fairly clear, others were not so clear. My first sort of clear area was that I wanted to go into STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics with a particular bent on you know, mechanical engineering and potentially physics. I wasn't sure at that point. But then another also potential interest that I wanted to go deeper into was the classical guitar, which I'd been playing for a very long time, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and which I just wanted to build up. So two years prior to actually applying to university, it was just a case of mapping out, you know, what were the things that I was most interested in, what were the things that I had been involved in, with the most depth at that point and what did I want to go into further on in the future. So after that it became a process of sort of organizing all my thoughts. So creating an actual timeline of what I wanted to do and essentially try to create a realistic plan of execution. So what did that entail? The first part of that for me was generally academics. So academics was always the most important thing when it came to applying to university in my eyes. And I felt that way, certainly, reading the websites and talking to other people who were more knowledgeable in this process than I was. So, you know, a lot of this process was just figuring out what were university requirements were, what they required for me in terms of SAT2s, in terms of, you know, language requirements, in terms of general exams that I took in high school to prepare me for university, that kind of thing. Then there's also there's also the notion of creating spikes and this is kind of an interesting notion that I became aware of after let's say talking to a couple of you know having some sessions with a few people who knew about this process essentially what that means is 
finding out which things that you know you have particular strengths in or which things you have particular interests in and go into those things in more depth than you go into you know other things then most people would go into other things hence the term spike meaning that if you were to look at a simple graph there would be a spike at that particular skill so for me that was of course the guitar was one of them then I also had other things um, obviously academics is a very good area to have a spike in so you know having strong academics is a big plus but then other things like getting involved in other activities in school for me was a big spike but generally from what I see at Stanford there are generally a, a couple of different types of people there are either people who have lots of smaller spikes I would consider that you know myself to be in that camp so people who haven't done anything in a crazy amount of depth but who have gone into depth in a couple of different things. And then there are people who have gone into a lot of depth into one specific thing. So that's a very big spike, essentially. So essentially creating those spikes is a very good thing for universities, especially you know, showing them that you are willing to go into depth into something that you're interested in and to take it further. So the last part obviously is executing the plan. And you know, the sort of the brackets and the sort of italicized comment is basically just trying to say that you know sometimes the plan that you create may not be the one that you necessarily follow the, to the T and that's perfectly fine I certainly made a plan with a lot of different ideas which I did not get into you know all of them because it just was not feasible in the time frame but certainly you know mapping out the key things essays you know academic tests that you have to do other things you know whether you know, like for example, I was a musician, so mapping out, you know, competitions that I wanted to perform in or mapping out certain things that I wanted to do, like a performance diploma, things like that, you know, are worth sort of writing down a simple plan, trying to map out when you're going to do them. And it, it's a good idea generally. Natu naturally, like I say, you don't have to execute all of them and sometimes it's just not feasible, but at least having a plan and trying to execute them is part of this part of the process so now another interesting topic which is actually choosing universities and how do you actually go about you know picking and creating a list of universities and this is actually pretty important and this is part of that planning process at least it was for me and so the way I went about that was I identified the areas which I thought was most important when it came to you know the university that I would eventually attend. So part of that is a strong academic program in the area of interest that I wanted to go into. So those areas of interest for me were mechanical engineering and potentially physics. So I wanted the schools to have good essentially physics and mechanical engineering programs certainly because those were two areas that I really wanted. So in order to sort of research that my first port my my first protocol was US News and obviously some of these ranking sites to see which were the good universities when it came to you know mechanical engineering and then after that it was just a case of you know identifying you know the top couple of universities well so I say the top couple but really I mean you know a list of a good 20 to 30 universities and you know who which are quite good in that particular subject and then just going through a couple of different ranking systems and then seeing which ones repeat you know, what's what are the common denominators and then then it's just a case of going into you know more nitty-gritty research so the more important things so looking up the departments looking up the specific programs and looking up the professors as well if there are any particular professors that are working on areas that are of interest to you or if there are a lot of professors who collaborate among fields that are of interest to you so just to give you an example, one area of mechanical engineering I was particularly interested in was solid dynamics. And my the reason I was quite interested in, in that was because I had joined a competition called F1 in schools, in high school. And part of that program was just essentially designing miniature Formula One cars. And I learned how to use special software uh, to design the cars and then just run simulations of them going through you know, air basically, and I really enjoyed it. And reading about the physics was fun to me. So Stanford had a really good fluid dynamics department, a very strong fluid dynamics department, and 
you know, I thought, you know, that's a, that's a big plus. You know, there's a university with a department in an area that I find very interesting. So, you know, that's just an example of doing a bit of research and finding out if there's a particular program or department that, you know, matches your interests. Then, of course, there are other things like extracurricular programs. You know, if you're looking to get involved in, you know, something specific or you're looking to try out something new, sometimes these extracurricular programs are quite good. And they're a good way of gauging what the student culture of the university is. Now, that's, you know, normally that's not a problem with a lot of these universities because their extracurricular programs are so extensive and vast. Often it's a case of where on earth do I begin as opposed to, you know, does this particular university have the program that I'm looking for? But that's, that's a factor that I certainly consider in that process. Now, another big factor for me was academic breadth and freedom. So what exactly does that mean? That essentially, to me, meant the ability and the, the freedom to essentially move between different subjects and different subject areas and to choose courses and to choose programs in a lot of different subjects. That, to me, was pretty important. Um, just to give you a bit of context, I also applied to the UK. In the UK, it's fairly structured in that you have you know, your five universities that you apply to, to you know, two through UCAS, and then essentially it's very much a case of I know exactly which program I'm going to apply for. You write your personal statement whereby you detail why you're interested in that particular subject and what you want to go for, and then you just apply. You probably give a few interviews at those universities but it's very much constrained in terms of what you do, what subject you pick. But what really attracted me about the United States was that you could choose what subject you studied. You know, a lot of the time it was maybe, sure, there are some universities you apply to specific departments, but you essentially have the freedom to choose which, you know, subject you choose, which subject you study, which courses you take. You're not constrained. So that was a big, important factor. And I wanted to choose a school that really kept me open in that sense. So having a lot of strong departments in a lot of different areas. And then other factors also, which are very important too, but which I generally thought about last when it came to sort of whittling down the list. So stuff like weather, you know, where, where the university is located, and also, you know, student culture, etc. Things like, would I genuinely be happy in this kind of environment? Or would I fit well and, you know, generally find it all right? I'll be honest, these were generally the, the factors that I prioritized low on my radar. Maybe I should not have done that, but thankfully I ended up at a place which had most, if not all, of these factors going for it. So these are sort of, this is how I kind of came up with my list. And it's fine that the list is very extensive at the start. Mine certainly was, but over time you essentially, you know, whittle it down. You come to terms with which are the universities that I, you know, really want. So the final decision. So um, in, I'm sure it's been advertised in the brochure and sort of the the sort of uh, marketing materials of this webinar. But essentially, I was trying to choose between three universities in particular, and those universities were Harvard, Yale, and Stanford. And I was not. It was a very tough decision. In fact, one of the toughest decisions I probably had to make um, ever. And in terms of actually how I went about that process of making the decision, I would like to sort of go through and sort of you know, tell you. So essentially, the deciding factor when it came to actually choosing one was academic breadth and depth compromise. So what that means is I wanted to have a, a university that had a good compromise between the academic depth in the areas that I was interested in, so mechanical engineering physics, but then also have a good breadth in terms of other areas. So that's the and more part. So for me, I decided, you know, Stanford had an excellent mechanical engineering program with a specific department in an area of mechanical engineering that I was very interested in. And the physics program was also very strong and well renowned. In, in you know in the country and across the world with collaborations with all of the major experimental labs you know from CERN to Fermilab to new astronomy collaborations that are going on so I thought it was a great school naturally you know schools like Harvard and Yale they have very strong physics programs for certain 
And there are other areas in which they are very strong, like areas like condensed matter physics. But, you know, I thought it was a compromise. I thought that Stanford had the best of both worlds in terms of mechanical engineering and physics. And so I decided that, you know, in terms of that area, I thought Stanford certainly won out. Stanford also has the benefit of, you know, having that breadth. You get into the university as a whole, and you're allowed to go into different areas. You're not admitted into a specific department. So that's a big plus. And that breadth that Stanford offered, I mean, the fact that you could essentially go into any major program, and they would essentially allow you you know, a great faculty, they would allow you a great department, create really strong programs, no matter what you chose, that was really attractive to me. And I think that was the main pull factor. But then another very key deciding factor for me was also guitar. I mean, I was not going to go to a school which did not have a guitar program. That was out of the question, almost. And so, you know, there, Stanford certainly, certainly does not have the best classical guitar program in the United States, not by far. But it does have a classical guitar program, and the classical guitar professor here is very experienced and has a lot of contacts in the classical guitar world. And certainly that compromise between classical guitar, mechanical engineering, physics, and academic breadth, to me, felt like a good fit. Naturally, there are schools like Harvard and Yale. You know, Harvard has, I believe it's the New England Conservatory, very close by which obviously has an excellent, excellent music program. But again, the sort of, you know, it's not on campus. It's the kind of thing that you would have to travel to visit. And then, you know, Yale also has the program whereby they have one of the top classical guitarists slash composers in the world at the moment, Benjamin Verdery. But naturally, I believe that Stanford had the best mix of all that sort of academic breadth and depth and guitar, and hence, that's why I made the final decision. As you can see, I'm sorry, I'm not really explaining it that well, but you know, it just goes to show how you know difficult the process was, how nuanced, and how you know. Yeah, Sandeep, let me let me. Uh, 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 that's that's really really good the way you've kind of laid it out. Sure. Let me, um, let me ask you a couple of questions because sure. this is this is something we 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 get you know very often. Let let let's start a little bit. Go back a little bit. When did you? Uh, when did you? And obviously, I know your family as well. When did you guys actually start thinking about the process? Was it in ninth grade, tenth grade? When? When? When did the kind of the thought process start in your head? I would say the formal planning process started around when I started my GCSEs. So that's about so year thirteen was our final year in school. Started around year eleven or so. Yeah. That's when I started to think about things and start to actively, you know look into things like SATs, subject SATs in universities. So essentially we started about then, which is by no means early by some of the standards of a lot of people, but it's certainly not late. It was not too late for us. That's right. when I sort of started to think about this and think about what are the areas that I really wanted to focus on. And in terms of, so, um, Listen, I think uh, you're you're one of the one of the uh, the students who's kind of done it all, done it very successfully. Um, how did you manage? So this is a question we always get. You know, how do you manage all the moving parts? So you know, as a counseling service, you know, we tell all our students, well, you've got to do well academically, you've got to do well extracurricularly, you've got to do great on the SAT or ACT. Can you give a sense of how you manage the whole? Um, sort of moving parts of the the application process. Yeah, it's a very good question, and <laughs> I can tell you, I still don't really know how <laughs> how it all came together in the end. Yeah. Certainly, I would say a big factor was a lot of help from my family and from generally, you know, people who knew the process well, asking them for advice. They were a big part of it. Uh, you know, my mom helped a huge amount. My dad helped a huge amount. You know, everyone was very supportive in that process. You know, obviously making a plan was is very much, um, it was not just me doing that. It was me, my family as well, sort of trying to flesh it out, you know, asking people for advice about, you know, how does this work, people who have gone through this process before, and then creating a plan. So that was part of it. But then, you know, as to have actually executing that whole thing, it was very much a case of trying to be organized, also not 
making sure not to sort of burn out in that process of doing a lot of things, but making sure to enjoy myself and doing the things that you know I enjoy doing. And just to give you a story to illustrate that kind of thing. Yeah. So when I was taking the SAT, that was a big that was a big thing. So that's obviously a test that is is quite important and you know although it's I, I don't agree with the fact that it's it's used and weighted so much in the process I I was quite nervous about it so the first time I took it um, I did reasonably well but you know I thought you know I could do better and the second time I was billed to take it I did not want to take it a third time I was very much of the sense that I I wanted to sort of take it a second time and you know I wanted to be done with it I wanted to hopefully get a, a score that was better than the first time but I didn't want to do it again and funnily enough the day before that SAT was a model United Nations conference so essentially I would not have a large swath of ta time about a day and a half to prepare for the exam so I would have to go in slightly beforehand yeah. to do it and so that was a big risk. I really considered for a long time whether that was something I was prepared to do. But at the end of the day, I just sort of rationalized it by saying, you know, this is something that I'm interested in, Model UN. And, you know, if, if it results in, you know, uh, a worse performance, maybe then I potentially could have done. At least I'll have done, you know, I will not have a regretted missing Model UN for this. Right. I was very much of, of the mindset that I, I don't want to do things purely for university. I also want to do things because I'm interested in them and I want to take them further. And this was a good opportunity to attend the Model United Nations conference. So I went and actually it worked to my benefit because it actually calmed me down a lot more. And I ended up doing better than I did my first time. And I was, you know, I was very happy about that. But I think it just goes to show that you know, try to do, you know, go into depth with a lot of things is certainly a great piece of advice, but going into depth with things that, you know, you're interested in and you're willing to go into depth with, I think is something that I wish someone had told me, you know, properly. It's, yeah. it, it's not just going into depth into a lot of things, it's finding which things am I most willing to, you know, work hard for, and then eventually it's a case of taking risks and it eventually comes out. I so hope that me, answers have, the question. No, that's great. Uh, so, Sunil, so, uh, so you've hit on a, a on a, a critical part of the application process, which is standardized testing. So, this whole idea of SAT, ACT, and you know, it gives not only you students, you know, a lot of anxiety. It gives us parents a lot of anxiety as well. Right. Now, how did you prepare for it? Did you take a coaching class? Did you work on books by yourself? Mm -hmm. You know, if you have advice for some of our students out there, how should they approach the standardized testing part? That that's a really good question. So it it took me a while, basically, to try to understand the process. But the way I approached it personally was, I did I did attend a sort of a coaching person, a coaching yeah. center. Yep. It, his name was Hashmat Khan, and he's based in Dubai. Essentially, what he did was give us a lot of practice materials, which we would work off, and then he would organize these regular, I would say, you know, I said that the, the last one and a half months before the SAT, he would organize these bi-weekly, you know, mock SAT exams to get us really involved and used to the process of sitting the SAT. Yep. So that was, I would say, my main mode of preparation. But in terms of actually trying to understand the exam, I would say there there are key things to it. So the first process is being familiar um, and getting yourself familiarized with the format of the test and just sitting and taking the test. So that can only come by getting full length practice exams and just taking them. So like any exam, doing practice exams, getting yourself used to the process of you know, taking that exams in in that kind of environment. That's that's very critical. You know what it doesn't matter what you do, what exam you take. You know, getting yourself and simulating something as it would be, that's a critical part of the process. The other part is actually, you know, going into the nitty-gritty details of, you know, how do I approach the critical reading section? How do I approach the, the math section? And that kind of thing. And that very much is a case of doing lots of practice problems and trying to understand how they mark questions, what kind of answers they're looking for, what style of questions that um, they they ask in particular and 
that is something that is quite hard to answer, but essentially what I would say to that is do a lot of practice papers, a lot of practice tests from College Board. So, you know, doing a lot of things from, you know, the Barron's Guide and Princeton Review is great for general preparation, but I did a lot of, I made sure to do a lot of questions from the exam board, College Board, to make sure that I understood exactly what style of questions they had, they were offering, and you know, what exactly they were looking for in their, their answers. And a great example is just the grammar section. And the grammar section, essentially, once you've done it many times, there is very much a theme that you can see that come, becomes very clear. There are certain style of questions, you know. There are very certain style of answers that they look for in a particular style of question, and that becomes very apparent. So that that's basically what I would determine, what I would say. And then um, the other the other big thing, obviously, with the standardized testing after that is uh, the grueling process of writing the personal statement and and the whole essay uh, writing process. Can you walk us through? So you know, we we hear a lot of this. Like, I have nothing to say. I'm not unique. Uh, mm. Not that interesting. I don't know why you know a top school would you know be. What is it? that makes it unique. So can you walk us through the process of from the first time you kind of saw the questions to how did you approach writing them and then getting to that whole process? Yeah, um, so essentially the summer before I would say my last year of school that's when I started to focus on writing essays yeah. and so what I did was over that summer I looked at the main prompt so I believe it's the um, common app prompt the big one that they have and yeah. that was a prompt that I decided to focus a lot of effort on, mainly because that was a prompt that the vast majority of the universities I was applying to would see, essentially. Yeah. I mean, there, there are a couple of universities that you apply through, um, you know, through portals that are not uh, the Common App based, but most, the vast majority of universities were through that. So I spent a lot of time thinking about it, and I believe the prompt I answered was, to do with um, a particular activity or something that I felt defined me. I can't remember specifically what the prompt was, but what I wrote about I remember quite well. And what I wrote about was essentially the guitar. So I wrote about the guitar as something that I would say was a defining factor. And, you know, there there's generally this band of approach to writing universities essays where you know, you can either write it in a very creative way or you can write it in a very straightforward way. And I think there's no right answer to that. For me, it was very much, I enjoyed writing in a kind of semi-creative way, not over the top, but you know, creative enough to show something interesting. And that was, that was what I went to. So the way I went about the process is I decided, okay, I'd like to write about my process in preparing for my performance diploma. And so that's a very sort of rigorous progress uh, process where you prepare for a 38-minute recital, essentially, and you prepare from a repertoire of fairly challenging, good pieces. And so I wrote about I wrote about that, but I decided to do it in a kind of interesting way, which is I wrote from two different voices. The first voice was my own, speaking about my journey through music and getting to that particular stage, you know, performing to through the, the guitar, uh, performing for the diploma. But the other part of it was a voice where the guitar spoke. So it was kind of like a personification uh, through the guitar. So the guitar was kind of describing what it was to be played. And through that, I basically described playing a particular piece. And so that was kind of a funny thing, kind of interesting thing. Yeah, no, that's, that's very unique. Yeah, it was, kind of, it was kind of interesting. And a lot of people do things like that. I think there's certainly, there's no, you don't have to do it that way. And it's certainly the kind of thing that I would say, it's certainly the kind of essays where your voice is the main thing that should come out. And that voice you have to make sure is very prominent and very clear. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be cookie cutter in the sense that it shouldn't just be written, you know, like how one has a perception that all good articles are supposed to be written. It should be written like how you, you know, see yourself, how you, you would talk, you know. It, people should read it essentially and say, yeah, that's your essay. I think a really good piece of advice I actually got about that was imagine, imagine, you know, you have a stack of essays basically from random people and say they don't have their names on it, 
and say they all get scattered on the floor and they're all talking about similar things. If you were to pick up your essay and read it, someone should be able to tell that yes, that's that's Sandeep's essay or that's that's your essay basically. Yeah. That's the kind of thing you sort of hit at. How long did it take you from uh, you getting this idea of kind of the, the, the instrument to actually writing the final draft, the final, the one you submitted? How many, give us a sense of how many hours you think you, 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 you took to do the process. Oh, goodness. I, I'm not sure how many hours it took me. I can tell you how many drafts it certainly yeah, took. Uh, Probably come up with an estimate. But... It took me in the ballpark of around six drafts or so, six okay. good drafts where I would generally reiterate the process. Basically, you know, because so the nature of the essay I was writing was kind of weird and experimental. It was a bit of a risk in that it was kind of weird. But right. because of that, it was very much a process of refining and then showing it to other people. So I, I generally showed it to my, my dad, showed it to my mom, showed it to a couple of people who who were knowledgeable about the college of col uh, the process of college admissions yes. and asked them what they thought you know you know you know would a college ad ad admissions officer read this and think about this in an interesting way or would this be the kind of thing that would be you know thrown out of the pile, pile immediately so i asked about that and then from there, I kind of reiterated. There were lots of advice that I got, you know, pertaining to things like, you know, you should try to improve your flow here, or I don't quite understand what the guitar is saying here, or why you're saying it this way. And, you know, obviously, the more people you show it to, the more uh, random advice you get, and the yeah. more diverse opinions. So I think it's a good idea not to show it to too many people, but certainly show it to people who you trust, whose judgment you certainly um, feel confident in. And go from there, I would say, certainly is a good piece of advice. But it took a long time. It certainly, I started that yeah. summer, but then it continued on. And it was very much a case of refining ideas. I would say that for the other processes, so the other university essays, which are quite small uh, by yeah. comparison, those were hard at the beginning because it very much came down to making them very personalized to each university. But, you know, once I, once I got through my first couple of universities, there was a general idea, there was a general format which I became very familiar with and the other universities after that, after I'd say the first five or six universities, you become fairly quick at recognizing the theme of certain prompts and using material that you've used before but molding it for that specific university. Yeah. Now, how did you approach in, uh, uh, the other decision-making process that we talk about is the idea of early action, early decision, regular pool, mm -hmm. you know, when you submit an application. Uh, it, it, can you walk us through how you thought about that and what you did? Sure. So my, my viewpoint with that was most early action and early, uh, say most early action programs put you at a disadvantage in terms of um, admission rates, I think. I'll have to check up on the statistics for that because I'm not sure what it is at the moment, but certainly that was the idea, the impression that I felt at the, at, at the time. You know, there are certain early action programs which, you know, were very competitive. And so I was very much of the opinion that if I wanted to apply for early action, then it would be the kind of thing that, that I would be fairly confident that I had a better chance of getting into than the regular decision pool. Because I'd heard a lot of stories, certainly from people in my high school, whereby they'd applied early action early early, and essentially it's, they got the, the dreaded um, um, refer, referral decision to the regular decision pool. And so yeah. I, I was kind of scared about that. So I really wanted to choose an early action program that was more suited to me. But obviously there's also the question of early decision, which you know almost always has a higher rate of admission because you're basically committing to that one university if you get in. Yeah, And so that I was not so certain about. I was not really certain about which university I wanted to go into. I didn't have a number one university for me. I had a couple of universities that I would be completely over the moon to get into, but I didn't have a number one. So I didn't apply anywhere early decision. But early action, I thought, you know, I would give Stanford a try because Stanford was a university that I thought, you know, had great aspects to it. I was not 
bound to go there if I got in and I could consider my options when I got all my results back and it was worth it I mean I had a higher admissions rate and were in the early pool technically but what I didn't realize is that there's a more there's more nuance to that kind of statistics and that Stanford uh, admits a lot of athletes during that time period so that makes it slightly difficult and so during that process um, I was actually in Cambridge at the time and I got that letter uh, for the early action decision and I got deferred so that was kind of interesting because I wasn't sure what would happen and I yeah. was very much of the of the opinion that if I get deferred but from a particular university then that's almost a certain rejection later on in the regular decision pool so it yeah. actually didn't turn out that way so it doesn't always happen that way but you know that that was my process going into it. I'm sure there are people who go through it in a in a very different way and probably a better way than I did. But for me, it was basically look at the statistics. Um, don't really apply early decision because I wasn't sure where I wanted to go and yeah. essentially go from there. Now, what about we'll we'll just briefly touch on this because um, it, it may be slightly off uh, off topic, but. As a family, um, obviously, num the, one of the, the, the biggest things is the financial commitment that the family has mm -hmm. to make. The whole idea of financial aid, financial scholarships, you know, how do we afford these schools and stuff like that. Um, did you, how did you guys discuss it? You know, you don't have to tell me details of what you guys did, but kind of how did you approach it in terms of, did you apply for scholarships? How did you think about that process? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I was, I, you know, obviously financial aid, there are certain universities that, uh, in the U.S. that give very generous financial aids. There are quite a few universities that give full financial aid, too. But in terms of that process, I, I knew, you know, very close to the beginning that applying for financial aid would put me in a very, very small category and a very... I would say a highly competitive category at that and my chances of getting into a lot of these good universities would be very slim it would be much slimmer than if I were to just apply you know regular so that was kind of a tough decision um, mm -hmm. essentially what it came down to is we made the decision that uh, we had enough money to put me through undergraduate um, studies so we decided in the interest of you know maximizing the maximizing the chance the probability of getting into the universities it would just be a case of not applying um, for any of those scholarship programs where okay. we where we were quite you know where we knew that we would be disadvantaged by that but then again it's not to say that it's you know it's crazily difficult to get into the financial scholarship and you know, there are certain schools, like for example Stanford. Mo uh, most of my friends here are on some sort of financial aid, and a huge percentage of the student body is um, you know, does receive some form of financial aid. So it's certainly a thing to consider, but I would say it's certainly something to be wary of in that it does make it it does put you in a very select group of applicants. And it yeah. means that your application rate is very different to the one that they advertise on their brochures. Got it, got it. Um, let me, I, I want to make sure everybody, if uh, if anybody else on the webinar wants to ask Sandeep some questions, you know, uh, Tanmoy can facilitate that or you can write it in the chat and uh, I'll, I'll try to repeat them. So if anybody wants to ask questions, otherwise I'll keep, uh, I'll keep Sandeep engaged with the concerns that we hear about. Um, so uh, Sandeep, so then after you've done all the hard work, uh, the tension starts when you're waiting for uh, letters to come and stuff like that. What do you do in between? Do you, uh, did you do anything? Uh, uh, did you send any additional information, or once the application is done, you just you know, I guess then you just wait for decision day, right? Yeah, that, that certainly is a very nerve-wracking period of time. I would say in that period, I was I was certainly nervous about it, but I decided that I would just continue doing the things that, you know, uh, I wanted to do. You know, I was involved in things like student government and sort of I, I was doing, I was going through a process of sort of reforming and rewriting their constitution and sort of trying to reform student government at the time. So I was going through that in a lot of detail. I was also playing the guitar, 
doing my music. Also, A levels were a big thing, and sort of preparing for that was a, 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 hot, a very big burden, basically. But yeah, I would say I certainly had the activities that I normally had, and I was going through them. I did slow down a little bit in terms of you know which activities I was doing because I was a bit burnt out basically after that that one term period yeah. because of all the university admissions and then also preparing uh, for academics and mock exams. So that was quite it. Do, it certainly does take its toll. So I was taking a bit easy, sure. but I was certainly I certainly was not I would say idling or twiddling my fingers. I certainly had a, a couple of things on my plate that I was interested in. And actually, another thing that I forgot to mention um, earlier on the webinar about the process of applying to universities was, you know, uh, you know, you you it came to mind as you said, you know, did you send anything across? So one thing I did do, which was quite helpful, was I created a very small, you know, website, very simple, which had a couple of different tabs for different things that I'd done, you know, a couple of uh, the reports I wrote for different internships and things like that. And also some of the clubs I was involved in in school, which I'd done some work with. So like, for example, the engineering club I was a part of, I just wrote about, you know, I wrote reports on what I'd done generally, and I put them on the website. And it's very useful to have, basically, because then you can, you can essentially show them links. You can send them links. I also prepared a resume, which I sent off to universities. And some universities do have a tab where they allow you to attach a resume. And in that resume, you can also put a link to your website. So things like that, so sort of getting out and advertising yourself and preparing documents was something that I did in the build-up to university applications, which helped a lot, which I forgot to mention in yeah. the actual chat. No, that, that, that's helpful. So, uh, um, so now after you get uh, you know, admitted to all these schools, you talked about the decision-making process. Um, so I guess one of the things that you know, our students are always curious about um, you know, once you get to Stanford or, yes. or Yale or Harvard and stuff like that, walk us through what's that like and like coming from, uh, obviously, you know, you've lived in India, you've lived in, you know, the Middle East, Dubai and, you know, um, visited around the world, but kind of, you know, the, the, what was it like in terms of what were your fears, what were things that Stanford did to make you feel more mm -hmm. comfortable? that whole process so some people have a sense of that yeah so that's a good question I suppose living far away from home is obviously going to be nerve-wracking I assume for a lot of people it certainly was a little bit for me I had been kind of accustomed to the process in that when I was 9 and 11 I think I went off to Brisbane on tennis camp alone um, with a couple of people without my parents so I was kind of used to the process of kind of used to the process of living alone even though sort of the the whole idea of you know spending that large a period of time I mean just talking about several months uh, almost a year away from home basically that was kind of nerve-wracking to me and I was quite scared about that I would say first first quarter of school I was all right second quarter I did feel a bit more homesick than the first partly because I went back for Christmas break and I enjoyed it, and then going back into that grind was a bit difficult. So that was certainly an area, and I would say, you know, in terms of that, feeling homesick, I would say it's only natural. You know, the best way to kind of combat that, at least the way I found, was, you know, talking to my parents regularly, you know, you know, listening to them, hearing their voices fairly regularly and going through that process. And then also, also I would say, just generally speaking to friends about the whole thing and going through that. I would say that's that's the best way to kind of become accustomed to feeling homesick. And it's something that everyone goes through. So I would yeah. not feel bad about it. It's something you can certainly talk to a lot of people about. Another thing is sort of courses. And that was a big thing for me. So I was not entirely certain what I would do in terms of which courses to take. And this is actually something I would probably have gotten into in the last slide. But um, one thing I was not sure about was whether I wanted to take the higher level physics courses or not. Um, I, I knew I wanted to do mechanical engineering. I was not sure about physics. I really enjoyed physics, but it was not the kind of thing that you know I would major in per se because I felt as I wasn't strong enough. I didn't have the kind of depth and the knowledge that a lot of other students had because A-levels is fairly, I would say, 
the, the level of physics is not very high compared to people who compete in physics Olympiad. But I decided to take a risk. I decided to go into multivariable calculus um, first off, and, and I decided to take the accelerated physics sequence. And it was a bit of a risk, but I decided and I rationalized it to myself by saying that, you know, and this is an opportunity to learn physics with a group of people who are very interested in it, who have done it to a lot higher level than I have, and yeah. people who generally want and are considering majoring in physics. So by doing these courses, I will understand what it means to be a physics major. I will understand what it means to go through the higher level rigorous courses. And I decided that was, that was important to me. That was what I decided and that I wanted to do. And so I went into it, and I do not regret it. In fact, after the first quarter, I liked it so much that I realized that you know the questions that I wanted to answer were really physics questions. You know, I wanted to. I realized that I started to consider research a lot more, which is what I'm doing over the summer in the physics department. And I realized that the questions I wanted to answer were more physics oriented, as opposed to necessarily applied research. So that's what I decided to do. I decided to go into that, and now I'm a physics major. You know, as wow. to whether I'll remain a physics major, not sure. But yeah. uh, I'm potentially also considering engineering physics as a major. But I'm certainly going to keep physics at the heart of whatever major I decide to do. Right. Um, that's certainly a key thing. So it's. I think it's fair to say you're probably working harder now than you've ever worked in your life uh, with with that sort of course load. I mean, yeah, I would say that it's. You know. It's sort of, it's sort of, I would say, the kind of argument that you know, you know, whenever you you reach a different stage of school or life or work, I think it's very much a case. It's always going to be a step up. University is yeah. a step up. You know, um, going to high school is a step up. For us, it was sixth form. Um, going from from middle school to sixth form was a step up. And you know, everyone goes through that process. It certainly is a lot of hard work. But I can tell you that if you if you choose to explore things and uh, explore courses that you're interested in if you sort of choose to you know be involved in that process of rewiring your mindset it's worth the effort I mean physics was a lot of work for me because you know it was very much a case of going through physics at a more rigorous level than I had ever gone through in high school or anything like that but you know immediately I remember looking at the first couple of problem sets and thinking how on earth do I answer these questions but essentially going through that process, working through that, it has essentially rewired my brain in the way that I think about problems now. Now whenever I think about you know, particular physics problems and hard problems, I don't immediately think, oh, that's too hard. I, you know, I can't solve that. Uh, I can't, I, I'm not even going to attempt that. I take a step back now and I kind of think, okay, what are the basic principles that I can break this down into? Where can I look for help in you know, answering this question? How can I break this down into its fundamentals and go up from there? So it, it's certainly a case that it's a lot of hard work, but you reap a lot of rewards, and you certainly rewire your brain in that process. Yep. Um, Tanma, I know we have a lot of questions from um, our uh, uh, participants. You want to put them on, or should I just read them out? How do you want to do this, Tanma? I'll just put a few audience on here. Uh, Dhruv, uh, you are on here. Please go ahead. Hi, hi, Sandeep. Uh, hi. Yeah, I was wondering uh, in a, in a university in the states, uh, which do you think the university prefers, academics or co-curriculars when they're looking at the resume or your application? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say what's good about the U.S. is they they do look at both. They do take a very holistic approach to it. But I would say if I was to rank one, it would certainly be academics. I would say academics is kind of the um, the filtering uh, criteria for them. So they're, I would say in terms of prioritizing something, whether it's prioritizing academics or prioritizing extracurriculars, I certainly prioritized academics and made sure I did not compromise on my academics. Yes, I did take a couple of risks within that because I was exploring some extracurricular activities that I really enjoyed, but I would say that academics is the the key factor, and it's certainly the kind of thing that will that will be the. I would say that's probably the first thing that they look at. I can't say exactly, but 
I would say that's the general consensus I got from people who are involved in the process. Right. And what kind of extracurriculars do you think they look at or they prefer they, that stand out from your the other crowd that applies? Yeah, it's a good question. I would say it. I don't, I, I'm not sure it matters so much as what extracurriculars you do, as as much as how in deep, how in depth do you go into. So I think that's right. the key thing. So whatever you do, you know, stick with it for a, a while, do it for a decent period of time, and also just generally try to take it to the next level. Basically, that's that's a key thing. I would say. I mean, it, you know, if you're if you're doing something that's fairly generic, I mean, playing the guitar is something that everyone, a lot of people do. You know, it's not uncommon right. to play the guitar, but you know, going through the process of attending music competitions for me, and then sort of getting a performance diploma, that's something where I've kind of taken it beyond what a lot of people do. So I would say it's, you know, choose what you're interested in, what you're willing to go into a lot of depth with, and then just go down that path and. Make it a spike, as they say, basically. Got it. Thanks so much, Sandeep. No, of course, yeah. Tanmoy, do we have anybody, uh, another question? Uh, so, Sandeep, I'll, uh, we've got a bunch of questions online. Hi, Yuri. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. Param, uh, you are on here. Please go ahead. Param, you are on here now. Please uh, ask your name. Param, are you there? Um, maybe uh, we lost him. It's okay. Uh, Yuri can uh, go ahead with the questions. So, um, so the uh, I guess a couple of people have asked, uh, you know, what kind of SAT scores do you need to get into Stanford? And we get this question asked a lot. So. Um, um, yeah, so hey, hey Sandeep, how are you doing? Hi, hi, I'm doing okay, how about you? Hi, hello? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I guess we lost. Hmm, a few weak signal. I think we lost him. So, um, uh, Param, if you can't uh, get online, just post your question um, in the question box, and I'll uh, I'll read it out for Sandeep. Um, sort of the average SAT score, and you know, is, is there a minimum? Is there a maximum sort of thing? Uh, uh, Sandeep, just quickly on that. Yeah, so I'm not sure if there's a minimum or maximum per se. I would say there's certainly a, you can get a good indication of what SAT scores a university typically gets from its you know accepted pool by you know, in, in on the university website, they normally publish those statistics. I know yeah. Stanford certainly makes it very clear. I think for Stanford, it's in the 2200 range, that kind of thing. I was certainly of the opinion that I wanted to get in the, you know, sort of 20, high 2200s, basically, at least, that kind of thing. So, not impossible, but certainly not an easy goal. But that was kind of the range that I was looking for. I think this is the kind of thing that you can certainly see. I would say go to the university website, or if they don't have it there, you can just send an email to the admissions officer and get that kind of information. Okay. Um, the so uh, you know without shamelessly plugging uh, student and other counseling services, um, the 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 role of a counselor, uh, 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 Sandeep, that uh, that played in your process, uh, is it helpful? Not helpful? Uh, how should a, a a student think about it, or how did your parents think about it, about using a, a counseling service? Yeah, I mean, we did use a counselor, and I think I re I I found the the um, I found the process very beneficial because you know the the good thing about counselors is that they know the process a lot better than than certainly I do and we did because we'd never done this before, so they can tell you the ins and outs, they can tell you about you know the process they've been experienced and they have experience and they've gone through the process of getting other people into universities too so I think having a counselor is very beneficial because they lay out to you the things that are important and they they tell you what to focus on basically so I think it was a very positive experience for me but then yeah. again I'm sure I'm sure you know there are certain counselors that 
would not, you know, would not be a good fit for a particular person. And so, you know, like anything, getting an advisor or something like that, even in university, and I would say later on in life from the people who I speak to, it's very much a case of I, I went around and I spoke to a couple of different counselors and sort of tr got an idea of, you know, who I would meld with, who I would mesh with well, and who I kind of agreed with. And I went from there, essentially. But yeah, it's certainly a case of it was a very positive experience for me. They they showed me how to go about the process, and I was very grateful in the end. But it's certainly a case of making a good decision with that, because yeah. that's a person who you want to have a good relationship with. No, that's uh, uh, th that's well said, actually. Um, you know, having that comfort level is, 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 is very, very important with your counselor. Um, did you think at all about a gap year? Um, so uh, uh, a few of our students will wonder uh, if I take a gap year, I want to travel or volunteer, or you know maybe you have classmates now who who did that. Uh, you uh, some thoughts on that? Yeah, I think a gap year is certainly a feasible option. Um, from what I understand, I did not really consider taking a gap year. I kind of wanted to go into university as soon as possible, but certainly a gap year is an option. I do have friends who have taken gap years. And generally speaking, the theme that I sort of see is that in those gap years, they've taken the opportunity to explore something and do something in a lot of depth. So they've kind of used that gap year to build up that spike in a certain area or in a couple of different areas. One of my friends, um, he did a sort of non, he started a non-profit organization that did a lot of organizing in, in Bangladesh. So yeah. it's certainly it's certainly something that is very beneficial. I would say a gap year, I, you know, if you do something, I would say try to at least talk about what you do and yeah. try to, try to. I would say doing something over that gap year where you explore and build up a new skill or build up a pre-existing skill is great. But yeah, I would say it, if you're thinking of taking a gap year, it's certainly not uncommon for people to take gap years. Right. Uh, did you, um, sorry, I should have asked you this uh, earlier. Uh, did you take any of the subject SATs? Taking a subject SATs, yes, I did. So I had to take at least two subject SATs, math two and physics. But I I decided that you know I wanted to kind of kind of go a bit overboard with the academics and that I wanted to really be competitive with a lot of the people going to these big universities. And as because I knew that there were certain areas that I would be quite weak in in comparison. So I actually took five of them. I took SAT 2 math, I took physics, chemistry, I also took French as well because I'd been learning French basically over a long period of time and it seemed like the kind of thing that I could take without too much hassle. And then I also took English, um, I also took the English um, English subject test yeah. which was not, which was not crazy, it did require a bit of, you know, a bit of examination but it was that kind of thing basically. Got so. It. I, I say you don't have to take certainly that many, but I would say taking a bunch, so taking a few more than normal, can help you stand out if if you get certainly above a certain threshold in those subjects. Great. Um, the so th this has been phenomenal uh, in terms of you know walking us through your journey. So as you look back on it and and you sort of lessons learned and sort of advice that you could give to our audience, um, what mm -hmm. would be kind of two or three things that, um, you know, students who are, who were in your position, who are in your position now, uh, can take to kind of make sure they have as successful a result as you? Yes, that's a really good question. I would say that there are a lot of things. Um, I would say the biggest thing for me, a very big thing, you know, not only in university applications, but even in university when you get there, don't don't be discouraged by what other people are doing and what they're saying. Um, you know, sites like um, College, College Confidential, I think it's called, you know, where people list their achievements and then they ask what the chances of getting into university are and other, other sites like that. And also just talking to people in school who are just doing a bunch of extracurricular activities all of a sudden just because, you know, they're supposedly interested all of a sudden or you know, clearly they're doing things just purely for university. It can be a very disenchanting process, but I would say never lose sight of the things that you are genuinely interested in. 
never lose sight of the things that you know you want to pursue in a lot of depth. And that's that was the hardest thing for me. It, it felt very much like a rat race at the time. And the only way I kind of rationalized it was by you know saying that these are the things that I, I'm interested in. If I was not applying to university, I would still be doing you know my guitar. I would still be doing student government. I would still be doing you know Formula One in schools. I would still be doing all of these things essentially. And so that was kind of the idea. I decided I, I, I did not want to compromise on the things that I was doing that I enjoyed doing uh, just for university applications. Naturally, I would do the requirements that they wanted from me, that I was required to do in order to get there. That's a natural part of the process. But I would say, you know, be comfortable with who you are. You have a unique story because you are a unique individual. It's not that you're not, you know, some high caliber person. You don't have to be. You just have to have a voice and you have to make it clear. And if you're worried about not having a voice in those essays, for example, that's not true. Um, you, everyone has a unique story because everyone is a unique individual. And I know that's kind of a very cliche kind of thing to say, but it is very much true. And if you start thinking about the process like that, it'll help you in writing. That's how I thought about it. And I didn't think I had anything special at the time. I, I still don't really. So, you know, be very comfortable with, you know, who you are. Uh, be very comfortable with what you're interested in. Don't get caught up with what other people are saying. You know, it, it's not a race against other people. It's a race against yourself. And that's something I found very much hard to come to terms with at university too. So that's, I would no, say, the main takeaway. No, great, great advice, Sandeep. It's a phenomenal uh, uh, presentation and sort of helping us sort of understand what it's really like to go through through with it. Um Last question quickly, uh, I know you started, uh, you know, an 11th, would you recommend starting a little bit earlier in terms of st thinking about this process, maybe in 10th, or uh, were you okay with kind of the, the, the timetable? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, I think starting at 11 was fine for me. I think I can see why starting earlier would help in, 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 a, in a big way, but I don't, I don't know. I mean... Starting at 10 would kind of, I mean, what it would be, I, what I would kind of imagine the conversations you would have with a counselor or someone at the, you know, at year 10, or maybe or your own would just be sort of whittling down that list, maybe trying to plan out things, you know, activities that you want to do later on. But I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. It's for some people it might be beneficial because it would give them a structured plan from which to benchmark and yeah. sort of uh, dive off. But for other people, maybe that, that year 10 is spent sort of developing the things that they're already doing and exploring other things as well. So I'll be honest, I'm not really sure if it's a good idea or not. I think it certainly depends on you. It depends on if you're comfortable. If, you, if, you, if university is very much a thing that bothers you at night and is the kind of thing that you, you know, find yourself thinking about a lot, then maybe year 10 is a good time to start. You know, I wasn't really thinking about it that much in year 10. I was certainly, it was in the back of my mind, but I was perfectly comfortable starting in year 11 for me. So, yeah, I think it certainly depends on how much you think about the process, but, yeah, I'm not really sure. Uh, listen, I think uh, your, your answers have really been uh, helpful. I think uh, you're modest. I, I, know, I know how much hard work uh, you put in, your family put in. So, you know, I, I think one of the things I want to make sure our audience understands is, you know, uh, Sandeep's an extraordinary student and, um, and person and, you know, there's just a lot of hard work that goes into this process. And so, you know, if, uh, if obviously student or any other counseling service can be of help to you, uh, we're happy to help and we'll contact all of you uh, should you uh, need additional advice. And Sandeep, uh, you know, what I think we'll do is obviously you know, uh, we'll follow your journey now that you've completed year one. You know, maybe we'll have you back in terms of how you're starting to think about, um, you know, maybe declaring a major. Yes. Maybe going on to graduate school. Mm -hmm. Maybe actually, you know, thinking about the whole job process, internships, and, and follow you uh, throughout your journey. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be very happy to. This is a very positive experience. I really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I think. I wish I had some, I wish I had something like this when I was going through the process. But I definitely agree with what you were saying. You know, yeah, your final remarks about 
this being a team effort, it definitely is a team effort. You don't do this alone. I had my family, I had my counselor, I had my friends, people around me. It's a team effort. And I would be very, you know, I'm more than happy to answer questions about, you know, what I'd done my first year and sort of go through the whole process of, you know, you know, later on going to graduate school and how I thought about the process because it is something that I've thought about a lot. I would yeah. say a lot more than I thought about universities at the time. So, yeah, I'd be happy, more than happy to come back. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Have uh, have the rest of your summer. Enjoy it. And, uh, we'll Thank talk you. Soon. Thanks a lot, Sandeep. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions, you know, through email for anyone who has questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thanks.